It's my pleasure to. Mm. How are you? Uh, not bad at all, Doc. And it really has been quite a while. Uh, how have you been keeping? Oh, quiet, listening and watching. Mm. Then that means we probably have quite a lot uh, that we can learn from you. Um, oh, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll soon find out. Uh, Doc, uh, Raymond had an interesting question. He wondered what your thoughts are on the general direction of Ghana right now. Well, the general direction is obvious. The current government has got the country into a real pickle. We are broke. That's the stack. Man has been in self denial for a very long time. It is compelled now to come face to face with the reality. You have overburdened. You cannot pay your debts. You cannot provide basic amenities. And your currency is in dire straits. You have inflation looming. The cost of fuel and other items are skyrocketing. And the prospects are not very, very good. Because when you look at the measures so far being put on the ground, those measures are not realistic at all. Hmm. The Bank of Ghana, three days ago, announced the increase in the policy rate by 250% percentage point. This is a typical capitalist solution to a peripheral capitalist problem. In Ghana, the money in circulation is not credit money. It is hard cash. So what had hard cash transactions got to do with credit? Policy rates deal with credit. If inflation is deemed as a result of a high level of liquidity, the form of that liquidity is very, very important to identify. And if the form of liquidity is hard cash and not credit, where has interest rate got to do with the use of hard cash in transactions? How do you mop up the excess liquidity in terms of hard cash and not credit? Hmm. So you see, if you want to practice capitalism, you must be very conversant with these principles and dynamics. And that's why countries like Ghana have always remained in the periphery of the global capitalist system. Capitalism is not just a, a, a mode of production of goods and services. It's a total way of life. It's culture, social structure are all linked. Mm. So you must understand the system in order to be able to play it. Okay. And so as a player, you must know that it is organically and systematically structured to exploit the periphery to the benefit of the core. And you are not a member of the core. You are a member of the periphery, performing peripheral functions. Your only usefulness to the system is that you have raw materials that the core elements need and must buy cheaply. And you must be the target of consumption of their commodities. Mm. That is the essence of the system. There is no conspiracy there. Cap core capitalist countries do not conspire to come and exploit peripheral countries. 
they exploit because the peripheral countries are exploitable. That is the essence, the organic nature of the system. Okay. So, Doc, what, what, what would you have preferred? I mean, now that you've talked about, uh, you know, the Bank of Ghana increasing policy rate by 250 basis points, not the way to go. We Both should have identified the problem as not one of demand, but of supply. A supply side economics will tell you that the current rate of inflation is driven by food inflation. Food inflation implies inadequate supply because if there were adequacy of supply, a person who has reached a point of satiation in food consumption will not ask for more. But because there are shortages of supply, effective demand is chasing the limited supply. The Minister of Agri has been denying this, that the so-called planting for food and jobs has been working. If it's been working, why are there shortages, supply shortfalls in grain? Why? Hmm. Uh, Doc, uh, if we can return uh, briefly to the, the policy rate. Um, you make the point that um, you know, the, the cash in our system is not is not credit; it's actual cash. It's cash. Yes. We, we trade over sixty percent of transactions are in cash. Yes. Um, could the policy rate increase be a move aimed at the future? Bearing in mind that this the, this government has uh, this Obatam Pakers program and and uh, uh, a plan to solve employment. Um, with entrepreneurship. Uh, when you increase interest rate, who are you hurting? You are hurting the business community where interest rates will go up and credit will become more expensive. So, who are those who are pumping the money into the system? You have selected or elected the private sector to be your engine of growth, which is a fallacy anyway. And yet, everything you do is to hurt that private sector. Mm. You have put up public expenditure cuts. In the 2022 budget, there is a proposed 20% cut where are you cutting? You cannot cut statutory funds. You cannot cut salary. So you have to cut on goods and services. Where are the, good, the cuts and goods services going? Don't forget, the government is a most significant single spender of the economy. Sure. And if you are cutting back on goods and services, it means you are hurting private enterprise. Mm -hmm. When you say it's a fallacy that uh, when we say uh, the private sector is the engine of growth, why is that a fallacy? It's a fallacy because the historical fact is that the average private entrepreneur in a typical third world country is not a creator of wealth or public wealth. He's a consumer of public wealth and an accumulator of private wealth. Private enterprise in our parts of the world do not innovate. They do not do research. They do not add value. What they do is that through patronage, political patronage in particular, they set up the businesses, accumulate, and use that money for themselves rather than for the public good. The government in a developing country has business to do business. 
simply because there are so many virgin areas in the developing economy that private capital don't want to go. And so it is the duty of the government to go into those areas. If you think that state-owned enterprises has, have historically shown to be waste, employ the very techniques of the private sector by contracting management on the basis of pay by results. Hmm. You make profit, you get paid. You don't make profit, you are not on a permanent stipend. Okay. That is how private capital works. Okay. If you don't know how to operate in the capitalist world, don't try it. Now, this business of government having a business to do business, how well have we performed as a country without We have government? not tried it at all. Kwame Nkrumah was the only person who tried it, and he was successful. Okay. He created the Builders Brigade, and the state farms. At least if the state farms were not making profit at all, you had hordes of workers who could rely on the farms for their own welfare. We wouldn't have had the high levels of unemployment that we are seeing. The teeming urban halls of unemployable employees and unemployed youth and the ramifications of this unemployed youth. Now, um, Doc, is this not a bit of deja vu? Uh, I mean, several mm -hmm. at several points in our history, we found ourselves, you know, at this point, inflation high, you know, currency weak, IMF lurking around the corner. That's why I said you have no business being a capitalist if you are not part of the core. If my country was a core member of the capitalist world, hooray, I would always urge for capitalism. The dynamics of the system are so that you will remain a peripheral country performing peripheral functions. That is how it is. It is the organic nature of the system to exploit the periphery. So, so really what you're recommending is that the NPP government ought to be more socialist? Not all, only NPP government. All our historically successive governments have not been bold enough. They've been blind to this need, imperative need for us to delink from the global system of capitalism. We need an increased South-South relationships. The linkage was a policy option voiced by new masters as far back as the early 1970s to the 80s. And it fell on deaf ears, simply because third world governments have a morbid fear of the unknown. We like to rely on so-called tried and tested methods. But the methods work in different environments. They may not work in your environment. How has China been able to relink? with the global system of capitalism from a position of strength. Because in these formative years, China was relatively isolated from the influence of the global system of capitalism. And during that period, China experienced the highest growth, accumulated public capital, and from public capital has relaunched itself into the global system of capitalism from a position of strength. Look, those individual Chinese galamsayers you see in our country, they are controlled. 
they are controlled by their central government. They are not just private entrepreneurs. State-led capitalism is what China is now practicing because it is in a position of strength. Doc, I mean, whether capitalist or socialist, one thing that is constant is that governments must raise revenue. Our government is proposing an e-levy to that end. Your thoughts? Yeah. Seriously, it's not only revenue side that must be tackled, but also expenditure side. Let us look at the e-levy. The objections are both moral and pragmatic. That you may chase away the participants in the electronic levy, uh, electronic transaction system, and thereby reduce the volume of transactions. And if you do, the revenue expected might not be achieved then there is the morality of it, the so-called stealing from my wallet. If you can target a particular section of the populace participating in the electronic transaction area <coughs> who previously were not part of the tax-paying entity, that's okay. Because then you are widening the tax net, which is something that we need. But you must balance this with also expenditure cuts. And the expenditure cuts must be targeted. Take a look at your free SHS system. How do you implement a universal concept of free SHS without means testing? As the finance minister himself said, he's in a position to pay for his child. Why should he be included in the cohort of pupils who must be catered for by the state? If the whole policy is aimed at bringing underprivileged children under the care of the state, then you must means test rather than a wholesale implementation of a policy because the effect is not the creation of equality, but the widening of the inequality gap. The affluent parent keep his money and rely on the state to cater for his child. Poverty is not only an absolute phenomenon. It is a relative phenomenon as well. The more I try to catch up, the further you go away from me. That is the relativity of poverty and inequality. <clears throat> well, um, if you just joined us, our guest is Dr. Tony Edu. He joins us on the Patriotism Series, and we're talking a lot about the current state of Ghana, the direction of it. Uh, we've been touching on the economy, and uh, Dr. Edu makes the point that it's not only about revenue, it's also about managing expenditure. Um, Dr. Edu, uh, uh, government has come under some criticism for its expenditure. Uh, the president has responded recently by announcing that there will be some pay cuts for appointees. A step in the right direction? Tinker Taylor, soldier spy. There was a, a British series like that. Yes, by John <laughs> Tinkering. Yeah. Tinkering. For five years, you have operated a bloated executive, 125 ministers of state. Over a thousand presidential staffers. Even if they are not receiving salaries, they are receiving 
largesse in cars, housing, and so on and so forth. This is where your expenditure is going. It's not going into productive enterprise. You've mounted so-called programs, which are Cinderella projects, seriously. Why do you call them Cinderella projects? <laughs> one village, one dog. <laughs> dog down. Which does not contain water when 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 they are needed. Waste of money. Show me one dam in the north that is functional, especially at a time when it is needed. Hmm? That's money down the drain. The whole host. You give money. To support people who claim to be putting up factories in your one district, one factory project. You don't monitor for the effect of the support that you give to these people. Have they increased employment? Have they expanded production? Cinderella projects that don't show productive effects that you are expect. All these, they are part of your expenditure which have contributed to the current hardships of the economy. It's an interesting concept there. Cinderella projects, uh, they look beautiful until midnight. And they return to the original form. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tony Edu, uh, uh, you were once upon a time a, a deputy defense minister. Um, we've kept our borders closed for some time now. Uh, the president says that uh, they are now considering the, the parameters under which we will reopen them, our land borders. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, some suggest that keeping them closed has really killed um, economies in our border towns and that the net effect was actually not worth the, you know, the cost of closing them down. What are your well, thoughts, especially uh, uh, in the sense of you know, us securing our borders from, from COVID and so forth? Well, you can't, you can't make them less without breaking eggs, actually. Security matters are very, very important, especially given the circumstances in which all our neighbors' beers are on fire. We need to be security conscious. But it is a fact that the closure of the land borders did have a deleterious effect on the local economies because they are part of the national economy. So, I would say that it's about time the borders were open. I think the reopening has been long overdue. It should have been open probably a year ago. Now, as a, as a former Deputy Defense Minister, you're, you're quite literally a security insider. So, I've been dying to ask you this question. Um, we are told um, by the National Security Minister uh, in answer to a question about how much Ghana is spending on hiring uh, private jets for the president's travels, we are told that divulging that detail would compromise national security. That's a hogwash. Okay, why do you say so? It's a hogwash. It's balderdash. How can the cost of presidential travels be a security issue? Who is going to use that information to threaten the security of the of the president? The itinerary of the president's travels, even that one, is not a secret. 
So how can the cost be a secret? Well, the argument, and a security issue. The argument is that it is part of... Uh, part of what? Uh, budgeting that is not uh, usually disclosed. But it's easily obtainable. You know the cost of the uh, uh, hired jet or loan jet per hour. You know the length of time that it was in the possession of the president. You can surmise in terms of landing charges and so on and so forth how much it costs. So you want people to speculate and give figures that may not be the exact figure. Which one is more security uh, uh, threatening? Speculation or the actual uh, 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 cost? Well, that's a question to think uh, uh, That's why I say it's balderdash. Hmm. Our guest today, Dr. Tony Edu, uh, on our patriotism series. And, uh... Yes, so Dr. Tony Edu, let's talk about our attitudes. Now, in 1983, when you were you know, doing your PhD, submitting your PhD thesis, you talked about Ghanaian attitudes and why in 40 years' time, they wouldn't change. Have you seen any changes in attitudes from the time you were, uh, you know, writing your thesis till now? Attitudes have gotten worse. A government constructs a road, put up road signs. The very next day of commissioning the road, somebody goes and cut the road signs for his own private use. It means you have no developmental culture. You have no sense of public priorities. We cannot distinguish private interests from public interests. And individualism is our creed. It's, 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 it's terrible. You cannot develop with this kind of attitude. You employ or even engage your own relative in your business. You come and destroy the business queen for you. Ign ignoring the fact that you and he must have a common interest. That as the business progresses, it inures to his own benefit as well. We are, by nature, very destructive people. Very destructive people. But let's focus on the political class. <coughs> let's look at the quality of persons there. What's your assessment of those seeking to lead us, or those who are leading us, and their quality? Round pegs in square holes. Most don't fit. And think outside the box. And that actually worsen the situation. Doc, if you could kindly reposition yourself, we seem to be losing you at a point. Oh, okay. Is that okay now? Yes, it's okay now. So if, if you can start again. Uh, I said... We have a problem with the political class. Most of the problems we are having in our political economy is bad management and the parasitic attitude of our leadership. Because of partisanship, you find People are given positions that they do not fit in. They don't have the professional attitude nor the intellectual attitude to manage those outfits to the benefit 
of the public interest. Mm. Now, and the ultimate consequence is that it creates a bad impression for themselves, the perpetrators, on the part of the mass of the population. Because it sets in motion a sense of relative deprivation on the part of the masses. That makes them also rebellious. Lack of confidence in the democratic dispensation. Because they believe that democracy is only a means to individual wealth individual wealth. Mm. But Doc, if we are destructive as a people and our leaders seeking their own interests, then we're doomed as a country, aren't we? Of course we are. We are. Unless there's a just our switch. We need a radical paradigm shift where we can inculcate in our people a sense of communalism. I don't mean communism. Communalism, the one that existed in our traditional society. In our traditional society, you'll be in your room and your father will come to you and said, we are strangers, so you vacate your room for the stranger. And the stranger may be a perfect stranger which your parents don't know. But because of good neighborliness or a sense of good neighborliness, visitors were welcome. Today, even family members are not welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Quite true. Well, uh, we're talking to Dr. Tony. They do uh, <coughs> patriotism month now uh, let's tackle the the concept of patriotism itself um uh, naturally the, the 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 root of any patriotic sentiment is identity you identify with your nation you identify with the values of your nation and then you feel uh, the, the, you feel compelled to sacrifice for right. for your nation um, do, do we have an identity that is compelling enough? What is that thing about being a Ghanaian that we can still beat our chest about and say, this, this is why we're special, this is what makes us proud, this is what we're ready to die for? This is one area where the colonial legacy comes in and sometimes when you speak of the impact of the colonial legacy on our developmental prospects, people don't seem to understand. We never built a nation. We have never built a nation. We are not building a nation. What we had on the eve of independence was a nation that was created for us. And the creation ignored tribal affiliations, geographical boundaries, and so on and so forth. In essence, an individual's first focus of identification is his tribe and his chief, traditional chief. Beyond that, Everything is individualism. Hmm. We've never built a nation. Nkrumah tried to build a nation. Nkrumah's modernization policy in secondary schools made us aware of each other's culture and each other's cultural nuances. We get used to it and we begin to identify with each other beyond our tribal and ethnic boundaries. 
unfortunately, that process of modernization was not powerful enough to remove the remnants of traditionalism, that is tribal identification, ethnic identification, etc. Professor Claude Aki, a Nigerian political scientist, once said, we must always distinguish between instrumental traditionalism and consummatory traditionalism. Consummatory traditionalism is the one that retards. Instrumental traditionalism always progress a nation. Hmm. Dr. Tony Edu is our guest on patriotism uh, on our patriotism series. When we come back, uh, Dr. Edu has, uh, well, he, he has a reputation for uh, calling a spade a spade. It doesn't matter which party he believes is getting it wrong. He does not mind speaking his mind. And so when we come back, we'll ask him a question that uh, perhaps he's uniquely placed to answer. Uh, does he agree with those who think that the current managers are, of our economy did not do better than the previous ones? when we return. What would you do if you have the choice to do anything in life? Build your dream house, take very good care of your family, and plan for a comfortable retirement. Plan a befitting funeral for your loved ones. When they depart, how would you live? If you knew there was a friend waiting to support you on all of your life's choices. You have such a friend in Glyco Life Insurance. Glyco Life has all the plans to meet your life's needs. Your child's education, your life savings, your mortgage, funerals, redundancy, and your retirement, and takes the burden off your shoulders. So go ahead and live life to the fullest today with Glyco Life Insurance plans. And remember that all our policies are hedged against inflation. Talk to Glyco Life on 0302 218 500 or 246 142. Also visit our website at www.glycolife.com or any of our branches nationwide for more information. Glycolife, we cushion you for life. Glyco, we cushion you for Everyone is proud of the doctor I've become. I'm grateful to a lot of people, but especially for basketball and the grit I built as I learned the sport. The rejections taught me to keep fighting. The long hours taught me discipline. Knockdowns taught me to bounce back. And those unexpected victories taught me never to give up. Nourish and energize your kids with Milo. Help them succeed in sports. Because the grits they learn in sports, they keep for life. Milo. Energy to go further. Milo. This advert is FDA approved. Four man, how can I say the screening be smooth, perfect? Where it they drive fast like that? Contractor, I always they tell you, see, interface self-leveling screen be the best solution. It they drive fast. Where it they make the job net. In fact, it pass analog. This be original digital interface self-leveling screen. Hey, babe, I hear you, interface man. Interface Limited is the leading supplier and installer of finishing input materials for the building and construction industry in Ghana. Call us on 0274-9999. Or visit our website at www.interfacelimited.net. Facebook, Interface Limited GH. Instagram, Interface.limited. Provident Insurance. Provident Insurance welcomes you to a new year. Remember to insure your new car or renew your existing motor insurance from the 1st of January to the 31st of March. You can win free gifts such as fuel coupons and several other branded Provident souvenirs. Rush for insurance cover now. Terms and conditions apply. With Provident, man, you are covered. Coffee in your cup. Enjoy on the set. The Super Morning Show is always the best bet. On Joy, 99.7 FM. Israel, 
show dr tony edu is our guest on our patriotism series and thanks for all your text messages keep them coming through and your tweets as well use the hashtag joy sms text messages on the super morning show are brought to you by glycocritical illness plan gsip it's in your best interest to survive now to get a telemade plan for you and your loved ones walk into the nearest sg branch alliance live and sg have created the best life insurance solution for you for more information, call SG Ghana on 0302-214-314 or visit our web their website on societegeneral.com.gh. Alliance Live and SG Bank, the future is you. We secure the future. Right, Yatiso, Yatiso, DSTV decoder, and Yatiso, a 129 Ghana CDs. Pet, this is their gift to you this Ghana month. Now you can buy a Zappa decoder dish kit plus one month of DSTV access for 129 Ghana CDs instead of the old price of 169 Ghana CDs. Men like you, G, uh, well, okay, GHS 129. 129 Ghana cities gives you the world's best for less with a wide variety of sports, international and kids shows. This is a limited time offer for this Ghana month. Offer is valid from the 1st until the 31st of March 2022. Rush now. DSTV, feel every moment. Winston wants to say something. Don't say it. Okay, I think I was. Yeah. <laughs> All right, listen, let's get back to our conversation. Dr. Tony Edu is our guest. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Edu, uh, the the debate has raged on as always it's always npp versus ndc and whenever we're in a crisis people start to compare yeah. so so what's what's your uh, dispassionate comparison who has managed the economy better john mahama or uh, akufuado at the risk of sounding partisan let me put into the debate or the conversation, the following facts. That the conditions for the recovery of the economy from 2017 had already been managed by the S.Y.L. Mahama administration. So it is sheer propaganda for Nana Kofuado and Baumea to claim that we know how to recover the economy. Those conditions had been set by the Mama administration. However, I have misgivings when the conversation shifts to this comparative management. of the economy by their respective administration. We need to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. 
conditions change. And therefore, when you are making the comparison, you also have to move from the achievements to the underlying conditions within which the achievements were made. I hope you understand that. Sure. So far, most of the objects of comparison have been mediocre. A government has the duty to attend to infrastructural development. So you build a hospital, a school, etc. What is the point of making noise about it? That is your objective. That is your duty. That's your responsibility. What is important is that you are guiding the ship of the political economy through calm waters and not through choppy waters threatening to sink it. President Mahama and his administration face difficult times in terms of the energy crisis. The method of solving that energy crisis took too long, in my opinion. Instead of attempting to solve it at one stroke, we should have done it by installment at a point in time when the economy needed the input, the energy input. So you measure yourself today, how many kilowatts of electricity do, we, do I need? What are my resources for putting those kilowatts into circulation? And you do it, and then you move on to the next. So it took too long for that one-stroke resolution to take effect. That's why the benefits were not felt during its time. But the foundations were put there by him. You come and you are enjoying the fruits of that foundation. And through rhetoric and propaganda, you claim credit for it. Hmm. That's why in the year 208, at the launch of the NDC manifesto, at which John Mahama himself was outdoored as the running mate to Professor Mills, the event was held at the Trade Fair. He made that statement asking us to compare records will be an exercise in mediocrity. But if they want, let them bring it on. Those were his very words. It was not running away from the debate. But the debate is a meaningless debate. Hmm. That is not what we want. We want, don't want mediocrity. We want progress. We want to move from point A to point B, not continue marking time on point A. Hmm. The hordes of unemployment and unemployable youth in the urban areas are growing up, are increasing. <coughs> You cannot look to the private sector to absorb them. Like I said, what does the government do? In 2009, at a cabinet meeting, I proposed the establishment of peri-urban agricultural homesteads. The cabinet retreat was held at Birmingham. 
uh, Kofi Annan Center, sorry. It was accepted by Pre President Mills, and the Ministry of Agriculture was asked to oversee its implementation. The proposal was for a PPP, Public Private Partnership, whereby the government will acquire land on the outskirts of uh, urban areas, go into grain production, animal husbandry, artisanal enterprises like carpentry, etc., using the unemployable youth, especially those who were at Agobloshi, who daily on could be seen carrying tubers of yam on their strong arms the whole day trying to sell a tuber of yam to motorists. The landlord or the local landlord will have equity in terms of the land that is leasing. The government will have equity in terms of the provision of capital and technology for tilling the land. Those who till the land look after the farm and will be housed in dormitories on the farm will also have their equity. A three-way split. The Ministry of Agri ignored it. But that is how you create jobs. That is where you move people who are operating in the informal sector into the formal sector and include them in the tax net so that you can touch them as you give them means of gainful employment. This is not an exercise in uh, <laughs> physics or <laughs> for instance, nuclear technology. Hmm. You see, simple things can be done by the government. In as much as economic growth creates employment, employment also generates economic growth. Hmm. The more people are employed or engage in gainful employment, the greater the potential for the national economy to grow. Hmm. Hmm. Dr. Dr. Tony Edu, look, I want to ask you a question about the future of your party, the NDC. Um, it, it's it's uh, it's just it's one of the two big political parties that takes turns to run the country. I've and never been very functional in recent time in the party's organisation. Mm. Well, but fair my enough. one advice, which I will use this opportunity to voice, is that the party must go back to its ideological identification. Mm. If it says it's socialist, it must embrace socialist principles. Mm. You cannot create a so-called middle class developmentalist through a petty bourgeois that is self-seeking, selfish, and materialist. You can't. Mm. Now, um, it would appear that our next election will be between John Mahama and whoever the NPP puts up um, as flag bearer. Uh, now, how, how does how does that make you feel? Uh, bearing in mind that you know you you personally criticized uh, John Mahama's presidency as having failed the accountability test. I think uh, coincidentally he said that in an interview with you, Winston, when you yeah. were at uh, TV3. Um, uh, with that in mind, I mean, how does it feel to know that at the moment your party's best that they can offer for president 
is someone who you think failed the accountability test. Well, you can learn. You learn from your mistakes. And I believe that he's a good learner. Okay. What, 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 what do you base that on? He himself has admitted that he made some mistakes. He admitted during the campaign for the 2020-2020 election. And I'm sure he can be trusted to keep faith with himself and with the people of this country. Right. Okay. Ah, Dr. Tony Edu, um, uh, it's been such a pleasure having you back on My the Super pleasure Morning being Show. On we appreciate your time very much. And there we have it, Dr. Tony Edu. Uh, one time head of research, right? Director of research for yes, uh, the NDC. NDC has been uh, head of uh, po uh, policy monitoring and evaluation mm -hmm. at the uh, you know, presidency, uh, and there's been deputy uh, defense minister too. Mm. Yeah, yeah, worn many hats. What, what, what would your uh, takeaway be from 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 this, Raymond? The wasted, wasted. Gary, people are happy. Uh, <laughs> at the core of it, you know, when um, somebody says the things you want to hear, to be fair. I have always been worried about the kind of debates in this country which lack the substance of ideological leaning and the conversations about political parties, their identity, their ideals, they departing from it, and yet running and ruling just in the house. So let me get this point that I'm making clear here. His point about the quality of people we have in our governance space, I identify with 100%. They are, some of them, are intellectually bereft of the substance to lead, and they are not inclined with public service in mind. So it's just about grabbing as much as you can till the next government takes over. And we've been bedeviled with that situation for quite some time now. So it's refreshing to have somebody who can say it clearly from experience and from what he has seen happening when he is no longer actively involved in the politics of the day. Nobody can dismiss the fact that quality in leadership has declined massively. There are people who are board chairs today who have no idea what it takes to be a board chair of a company. There are people who are ministers, who are deputy ministers. They are leading state institutions. Could you, they won't pass interviews at private entities. And yet, we cannot bank our hopes on any experience they bring on board, except maybe for political expediency. So, if a, and you see, if a developed country is doing this thing, because you have their structures built up, it's not a big deal. But for we who require every single person's contribution before we cross more hurdles. It is absolutely interesting to have such views coming from him. The other part is also the fact that, you see, the political parties, now it's become like a, a church group. The only qualification is being a member of the church or being male or female to belong to any of these. The competence to do proper ideological thinking is missing, ideally. Hmm. Check how they write even their manifestos. You can see the manifesto is one meter ahead of the ideology of the political party. Hmm. In very diverse ways, you, you can't understand the path it will take it. So, I mean, I'm excited that people like him, uh, not bringing us back, but connecting both words, the old and the young, and the young getting to appreciate. This might not be popular talk on social media or on Twitter, because it talks about the fundamentals of a state, the ideals that should build a state, whether or not we are heading in the direction of a nation state, are as important as everything. And we can go around introducing interim measures, medium-term measures, or whichever one. If we do not fix these fundamentals, we are still going to be in more deep trouble. You see, the exercise of mediocrity, of engaging in mediocrity, ah. 
that he talks about. First it was briefly, but now it's become permanent situation. Yes, but you see, Dr. Edu talks about when you say the private sector is the engine of growth, uh, that's a fallacy. And that government has a business in doing business. In our part of the world. In our part mm. of the world. Mm. That's instructive. And it's the reason, even in our local economic development policy, mm -hmm. we taxed our district assemblies to lead them. Mm. And when this government took over initially, what they did was to dedicate 2 million Ghana cities to every district about equity for the commencement of a one district, one factory, recognizing the role that the assembly or the government has to play. Mm. Unfortunately for us, mm -hmm. most of the times, because of this exercise of comparison, where we want to say we have done this, we don't see out the good policies we have. We resort to number, number games. And so all of a sudden, we have created this number of industries is what we think about. We changed everything when prior to the election, we had a card that indicated the competitive advantage of every area. That's true. And so what we would have been doing right now is to be developing the competitive advantage in every area to be able to serve the needs of the area and export it from that particular community. And as we, as we export from the community, we also create a service industry to feed the community. Unfortunately. Wonderful plan. We didn't see it to its implementation. Hmm. Yeah. You see, and so when you hear these things, I'm, I, I mean, I'm very excited because when you hear these things, this is the kind of discourse that drives a nation. Mm -hmm. And we are the periphery when it comes to capitalism. It's, it's fact. Yeah. Mm. We are not part we of the world order. We are material producers. In fact, with a single change in policy somewhere, our gold sank years ago. Yeah. Our oil can go down. Mm. Eventually, every policy that's not controlling the economy is coming from elsewhere. So, mm. I, well, anyway. Cinderella projects. <laughs> that was it. That, that was key. That was it for me. Uh, and and you know, it, for, it, if you look at this from a from a nation building perspective, it borders on crime that we would dedicate such huge amounts of our limited resources to projects that were first of all not designed to succeed. Secondly, after the money is spent, we don't chase it. We don't monitor it to ensure that it doesn't become a wasted investment. We don't measure the impact on the people that it was supposed to benefit. And we don't admit when it goes wrong so that we can go back to the drawing board and fix it. We keep calling our failures success. Mm -hmm. We insist and changing the metrics. To we insist anyway. that it is working when it's not. And the people who are supposed to benefit from it are getting nothing. But the money has already been pumped into it but because of politics. So we will call black white until the money is completely gone and unsalvageable. I think it borders on crime that we allow our leaders to do that. There are people whose entire livelihoods would change if even one of these projects were to work. So when it's not working, we have an obligation to do everything to make sure it gets on track. But we won't even admit that it's not working. So how will it ever get back on track? We're failing our people. Dr. Edu is right about that. Uh, listen, uh, we've got more after these. Stay with us. Yeah. 